Uh, all right, looks like we have uh, panelists on board. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Igor. Thank you, Pavel, for joining. Uh, we'll get things started. I think we're live on, on YouTube live stream as well. Uh, and I, thanks for confirming that you can see the slide. So we have a slide set, but uh, obviously this will be like interactive and hands-on as well. Uh, just as a quick introduction, I'll, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves too. Um, my name is Ray Paik and welcome to our, I think this is our first event outside of monthly community calls. So we're obviously very, very excited and thrilled to see uh, 70 plus people joining us from, uh, looks like from around the world. Uh, so welcome. And hopefully this will be first of many uh, sort of technical hands-on workshop uh, that, that uh, we'll do uh, uh, in, in the future. Um, and obviously pre-aggregation has been a pretty popular topic in our marquee feature. So we thought this would be a good topic. And based on the number of registration and people dialing in, um, uh, we're pretty happy with the with with the choice. Um, so, um, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll get started here. And as you know, may know from our monthly community calls, we do have a code of conduct at at Q, uh, JS community, uh, and we want to have a welcoming and an open environment. So if you want uh, to see details of our code of conduct statements, uh, you can go to our repo, uh, take a look at details, and um, let me know if you have any questions and. Uh, some quick notes before I turn things over to our, our speakers is um, many of you may have done other Zoom webinars. So if you have any questions, uh, I mean, you can obviously type it in chat as, as some of you have already done, but you can also use a Q&A function. Uh, and all of the like uh, QDAP team members will monitor those questions as they, as they come in. And our, what we plan to do is at the end of each section, uh, agenda section, we'll pause and address some of the top questions that we have and before, before jumping onto the next one. So don't feel like you need to wait all the way until the end. We built in some ample Q&A time at the end to answer your questions, but uh, feel free to type your questions as we go along and, and then we'll monitor them uh, as the uh, speaker is covering their materials. Um, and you may also notice, uh, you know, I sent an email a couple of days ago and announced it on various uh, social channels we are using KubeCloud today uh, for our hands-on exercise that Ryan will be walking uh, people through. Um, you know, this is obviously a product that hasn't been launched yet. I think some of you may have had uh, access to it at, uh, via our early access program. So some of you may have had a chance to uh, use it uh, prior to the talk, but uh, you know, this is something that's gonna be GA in a few months. Uh, but we thought, I mean, this actually provided us with a nice way of sort of provisioning an environment uh, for, for a tutorial setting. So hopefully you, you get a chance to take a look at uh, the KubeCloud product that, that we're building and um, you know, get some experience uh, using pre-aggregations as well. Uh, and as some of you already asked, uh, this session is being recorded. Actually, it's being live streamed right now, uh, but it will be posted on the YouTube channel. Um, you know, unless there's a there's any edit required, it you know will only take a day or two uh, to get uh, posted online. Because uh, I do realize there are people who signed up from countries like Australia. It's like at two in the morning right now, so I doubt those people are able to dial in. Uh, and if you had any colleagues who are not able to attend the call, I mean, feel free to uh, pass on the link um, so they can they can follow along. Um, also, uh, after the event, uh, you'll receive a post-event survey. Uh, it's a sh you know a short like a five or six question in Google Forms, and it'll really help us. Uh, with your feedback on how we can uh, plan future events. Uh, there's a, in particular, there's a question on what are the topics you want us to cover in future workshops. Uh, I mean, we do have some sense uh, based on the questions we get, um, but, uh, but we also have the option for you to sort of type in other topics that we haven't listed there. Um, so your feedback would be valuable uh, for future uh, workshops. And uh, you may have seen a social post like last week. Um, everybody who's you know joins our call looks like about eighty plus of you. Um, you'll have a chance to receive your uh, pair of QJS socks, 
Um, and if you want to, you can just provide your like a shipping and, and uh, shipping information in the survey as well. So you don't have to deal with uh, uh, another email from me um, uh, regarding uh, the pair of socks. And uh, I'm not wearing it today, uh, unfortunately, but uh, I, I should have uh, so I can dem demonstrate it. But uh, we're pretty confident that you'll you'll like the pair. Uh, it'll be a nice addition to your wardrobe. So. Cool. Without further ado, uh, let me. Uh, I'll just. Uh, I'll. I'll. I'll um, discuss the agenda real quick, and I'll. I'll turn things over to Pavel. Uh, so we invited Pavel, who's our CTO and and co-founder of of Cube Dad and sort of uh, uh, father of Cube Jazz pre aggregations, if you will. Uh, so what is to talk about? You know why pre aggregations, and you know what makes our pre aggregations uh, different. Um, and uh, after that, we'll turn things over to Ryan, who will um, who will uh, go through uh, the live demo, and and you'll have an opportunity to sort of follow along hands on on Cube Cloud, uh, and we'll uh, discuss like the tips and tricks, particularly in the production environment and resources and the Q and A. And like I said, any Q and As, I mean, feel free to. It looks like several of you have already typed questions already. Uh, feel free to do that, and, and we'll monitor them as we go along. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, Pavel, I'll turn things over to you. And if you like, I can just uh, advance the slides uh, so you don't have to share your screen, if that works. Yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, cool. thank you, Ray. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah I really just uh, would like to uh, give you a really brief introductions about uh, why pregations, why do you do you need those and also just what they are so for those who are already users of pregations uh this can be a, like kind of obvious but but just wanted to give a highlight because people um uh, ask us a lot about uh what is it and it, it just uh, five minutes highlight so uh, uh to start with uh, why? Why do you need pre-aggregations? Uh, so basically, uh, pre-aggregations solve uh, uh, mostly the performance problem of your application. And uh, the reason for it, like data is growing every day and uh, uh, to catch up with it, you would need to build uh, really uh, like uh, fa fast and responsive and also cost-effective applications. Uh, uh, given we are living in a world of uh, cloud data warehouses. So it's why uh, basically pre-aggregations uh, make sense. Yeah. Yeah, if we go to, to the next slide and uh, uh, talk about a little bit, what is it pre-aggregation? So essentially it is, it is cache, uh, but it is uh, like a smarter cache. Um, we've asked about uh like for new cameras like new camera applications users usually asks us if we download all the data into memory serve those from memory no it it, it isn't the case and pregations are much smarter than that so this is actually um, a condensed version of your data and essentially um, so when we condense this data uh, so as an input, we can have like uh, like millions of rows and output will up tables, uh, which is uh, most used type of pregnancies are usually much smaller. And this allows us really to cut the cost of data access uh, like uh, from like dozens of times to even thousands of times uh, for uh, specific queries yeah and if you go to the like example of pregation data pregated data so uh, as you can see on the slide so uh, how how we can make this happen this is a really really simple example of uh, uh, like orders on the right side we have orders with order ids as a raw data table and we have products there uh, and let's let's pretend we are want to know uh, which um, product in terms of quantity. Oh, Ray, can you can you please refresh this page? I think you have like. Uh, I'm sorry. Like, like an old version, yeah. Just 
some glitch with Google presentation. Right, sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so uh, and the thing is, uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on the left side, you see the raw data and, and let's pretend we want just answer queries like uh, uh, how many ice cubes we sold by month uh, and uh, or how many uh, uh, like uh, like products in total we sold uh, by month and write table answers all those questions however it it has only like 120 rows instead of like 1 million if you have like raw data for example and uh, uh, this is uh, like like mechanics behind that is a multi-dimensional analysis you can learn more in our documentation we have some links to external sources uh, but the idea so that um, uh, some function aggregation function is decomposable so you can uh, sum it uh, like on a various level of uh, dimensions. So if you can see like ice cubes in July, uh, like sums like four and two sums to six, and it's obviously uh, uh, like you can get this result if you're aggregating by, by months or aggregating by product. Uh, obviously you cannot get order ID from this table after you propagate the data, but this is a trade off you get when you're using the propagations. Yeah. So if you are, we are going to the next slide um, and just talk about um, uh, how like uh, this propagations approach is usually adopted. And if you're uh, basically uh, trying to implement uh, your bespoke uh, customer facing application usually uh, like will be in a position where um, you you starting without the caching at all and um, as you going forward with production so uh, you start seeing like problems at serving uh, bigger tables and uh, what we usually see all the approaches uh, like to build a solution like propagating data in house uh, mostly uh, uh, fail and uh, usually it's uh, it's too much uh, to uh, to spend uh, in a in a smaller organization in terms of like time effort uh, we see a lot of like this approach isn't new and it's used by bigger companies uh, like for example uh, under the hood of google analytics or mix panel so um so and it's why uh, really um, 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 yeah if, if you go to the next slide uh, yeah so and it's why uh, you probably would like to use uh, pre-aggregations so it's basically uh, speed up your queries uh, uh, and it's uh, the first goal you want to achieve here and also it reduces uh, data processing cost. Uh, this is especially uh, significant when you use um, uh, cloud data warehouses and you need to, so every access, if you know, like uh, BigQuery or Athena pricing models or, or even Snowflake, if you know your pay there for data access and uh, every data access um, like to raw data uh, costs you much. However, most of your users uh, of your applications uh, most likely for 90% of their queries don't need to access raw data and that's why pre-aggregations can uh, like cut your costs a lot yeah and it, yeah and again so save your engineering uh, team uh, days and weeks like of work and effort because uh, it's uh, like to build in house uh, like it's really tricky to do so yeah and going to the next slide, uh, so why like uh, Cube is very well suited to build this uh, like basically pre-aggregation layer and caching layer. Uh, first of all, if it's an API and basically what we 
figured out and what we spotted from like from our usage and feedback api makes uh, like kubejs api makes basically uh, uh, all the interactions with uh, data sources in general and also propagation transparent for users so and if you build an application which is uh, for example served by actually raw data at the beginning so and you already built your application front end code is in place you have all the charts but you have uh, like uh, you you start seeing all the performance issues so you can introduce pre-aggregation layer transparently for your users so you don't need to change any front end code usually so the, that's the one thing and i'll say that this one is used to replace even data sources of pre-aggregations if you want for example to migrate from your postgres uh, data warehouse or it's like or your otp database move to for example uh, bigquery or snowflake eventually so this one works as well and um, the second the second thing is a cube store um, and it's um, cube store is basically a layer we designed it to uh, store and serve pre-gated data it's designed to store really like hard cardinal uh, roll up tables so uh, we are aiming for like billion roll roll up tables here and um, the thing is uh, cube store allows you to uh, and the storing cache to uh, to do not depend on pre-aggregation complexity so if you uh, obviously introduce some complex pre-aggregation and uh, basically uh, the uh, pre-aggregation is complex and it's uh, it takes a lot of time to execute and build but serve time doesn't depend on it and also what we're trying to do the serving time doesn't depend on um, data data amount itself uh, which is uh, usually um, like really tricky to solve yeah and if you go to to the next slide just to like a brief overview like uh, the simple architecture you've probably seen it uh, from our blog posts. So, uh, uh, how, how we achieve this, um, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 basically decoupling, uh, on a, on the server side. Uh, the thing is, uh, there are, there are, uh, multiple layers in our, uh, architecture. Uh, so, so you have API instances, which, uh, basically solve only one problem and it's a serving traffic and fulfilling user requests and actual build process is uh, is done by refresh workers and uh, we have like cache and queue in place which is basically allows you to um, schedule all, all the workload in terms of like variation building and but actually cube, cube api instances if you if you're using this architecture not involved in this process anymore yeah in the last uh, several months we were working hard to achieve this uh like really high level of decoupling and also we did a lot of um, uh, modifications on how traffic is served and if you're using cube store which is now by default uh, all cube api uh, instances are uh, using shared nothing architecture which wasn't the case uh, just like several months ago when it was uh, was using redis to serve the traffic right now if you have a cube store cube instances doesn't rely on redis anymore to serve traffic uh, for uh, cash uh, like for pre-aggated data which will which basically allows you to um virtually um uh basically uh, unbounded horizontal scaling in terms of cube api instances yeah so yeah obviously this is uh, like really really brief overview of pre-aggregations and we are going to discuss a lot of um hardcore questions uh after our presentation but yeah so uh thank thank you for your attention and we'll discuss uh, all, 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 all the like your questions just a little bit later. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 
been looking at uh, questions on Q and A, uh, Ryan. You probably see them too. I mean, there there are a couple. I, I think they're related to uh, like particularly about Clickhouse. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to address those before we move on to your hands-on workshop, or uh, how how do you want to do them, Ryan? Or or should we should we just uh, start with your uh, live demo first and then address these questions afterwards? But, um. Yeah, I guess if there are any follow-up questions on what Pavel just discussed, uh, we we uh, we can talk about those. But I think let's let's start with the demo actually. Yeah, yeah, because I think some of these, I mean, questions might might be addressed. Is what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, so all right, so let me stop sharing, and then Ryan, obviously, you'll take control, and we'll go from there. Sounds good. So I hope everyone here has uh, created their first deployment on KubeCloud. Uh, we sent out a message earlier um, uh, giving instructions on how to create your first deployment and how to connect to a database that we've hosted, uh, an Aurora Postgres database. Um, so that's what we'll be using today for this uh, kind of demo, which I hope all of you can follow along with. Um, just to note, uh, those of you who may be running um, KubeJS uh, yourself locally or, or hosting it yourself, um, you can actually uh, also follow along with uh, pretty much all of these steps as well. There's just some really nice features in KubeCloud around visibility uh, with respect to pre-aggregations and with our queries that we'll be running that uh, will make it very uh, nice for us to show here in this workshop. Um, so the background here is let's imagine we are an e-commerce business and we have a very large data set. Let's say um, an orders table that is, uh, I think we're at, this one is about 30 million rows of data. It's, so we have, let's say about five years of data um, and it's, a, it's obviously a very large data set and we're trying to build some applications that uh, surface this data to our users. Um, and I'm actually curious, we didn't ask this question in the survey of how large everyone's data sets are, um, but if you'd like to volunteer, uh, if, if you are in the millions or tens of millions of uh, records in your data as well, uh, please, please share that in the chat. We'd be interested to know. Um, so uh, let's first run some queries. Um, and just to make sure y'all can see my, my playground, right? This is, a, this is a feature that is also an open source, of course, and is heavily used. Um, so we're gonna run a baseline query first. Um, I'm going to take, uh, oh, I need to move some things out of the way to my screen. <laughs> uh, order status as one of the dimensions. Uh, the count of orders is going to be our measure. And we're going to also take creation time as uh, one of the dimension as the time dimension. And let's do, run this query for this year and let's group it by week. Okay. So run that. And I hope all of you are following along as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is going to take a bit of time because obviously we haven't added any pre aggregations. And actually, we can check. Uh, well, if you're interested to know as well, this is what the SQL statement looks, looked like that we ran. Um, but we can also check out how long that query took. I'm just going to say in the last uh, 15 minutes. Uh, it took about nine seconds to run that query. So that would be definitely, that wait time would definitely be noticeable for our end users. Um, let's see what we can do to potentially speed that up a bit. So let's uh, go back to Playground and uh, run that query again. And this time, we're going to click up here in sort of the upper right where it says query was not accelerated with a pre-aggregation. And this is going to bring us to a feature we call the Rollup Designer. Uh, so this is also a feature that it is usable on open source QJS as well in Playground, um, called a roll-up designer because we sometimes call pre-aggregations 
also rollups because pre-aggregations by default are of the type rollup, and that's by far the most useful type of, of pre-aggregation. Um, but basically what this is enabling us to do is to create a kind of pre-aggregation definition without actually having, having to write any code, which is really nice. So this is the query uh, that we just ran. So you can see there's the count measure. Uh, our the creation time is a time dimension uh, and also status is a dimension. And uh, so the, the rollup definition would be in this screen here. Um, if you, so if I were to change this, uh, let's say I removed status as a dimension. Well, that would mean that the resulting pre-aggregation would no longer include status as a dimension. And it's also letting me know, okay, this pre-aggregation no longer will match that query that I just ran um, in uh, Playground. So just be warned about that. We'll just go, we'll just take the, the, uh, the pre-aggregation that was originally suggested to us. And I'm gonna call this my first pre-aggregation. And then I'm going to add that to my schema. So this button here, you'll notice that granularity is in days. When we ran, we, or the query we ran was grouped by weeks. There's a reason for that and I'll explain that in a bit. But first, let's take a look at uh, the pre-aggregation. So we should see that notification, of which I X'd out, sorry. Uh, but uh, a notification that that pre-aggregation was added to our schema. So if we now go to our schema view, oh, and you'll also notice, uh, for those of you who are new to cloud, uh, there's two different modes that uh, the schema and the API can be in. Uh, we have a development mode and a production mode. So whenever you're editing the schema, like we are now, uh, we'll be switched over to development mode. And basically this creates just a feature branch where we can be you know, editing our schema without uh, fear of interfering with uh, production. Okay, so in the pre-aggregation section, we see, okay, great. Our first pre-aggregation was added here. Um, now we can also take a look at the pre-aggregations view and see the first pre-aggregation there. Uh, it's not built yet. Uh, so we could go in here and build it from this screen. So this is going to take, um, I expect about half a minute. Uh, but basically what's happening here is we're building this pre-aggregation um, and loading it onto KubeStore so that our future queries uh, will be able to make use of this data. I'm just gonna quickly check the chat, make sure are having are able to uh, follow along. Uh, looks like we're pretty good. So yeah, now this pre-aggregation is, should be built. Yeah, it looks like it took about 34 and a half seconds. Um, you'll notice uh, this says automated refresh is disabled dev mode. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, oh, I guess, yeah, Let, let's go back to playground. So now if we run the same query, it should be, wow. <laughs> I just clicked the button and the data came back, the, re the results turned back. So that was lightning fast. You'll see, okay, query was accelerated with pre-aggregation. Great. Um, so if I, and I can actually look, inspect how much time that took. If I go back to my queries tab and voila, it took about a 10th of a second now to run that query. So a much better <laughs> response time than for uh, earlier without the pre-aggation when we were, I guess it was five seconds the last one and nine seconds before that. Um, so that's really neat. Um, now, going back to the pre-aggregation, uh, 
let's take a look at actually what data is in there. So I so you, I'm in the pre-aggregation section, and there's a couple tabs down here. Uh, there's the partitions tab, and we'll we'll discuss what partitions are in just a second. But we can take a look at the preview. Well, actually, you can take a look at the definition as well to see the um, the how it was defined, and you can also preview the data here. Um, so similar to that table, that simple table that uh, Pavel showed you earlier, this is how the data, the condensed data, it looks like, right? We have the dimension of order status. And then basically for each day, uh, we've created a count of the orders. Now, <clears throat> some of this data, so you might be asking yourself, OK, so this, uh, <laughs> this uh, pre-aggregation uh, contains data that would likely need to be refreshed, right? I'm, I'm, my business is still in business, right? Orders are still going to be coming in. Uh, I can't just have this, this pre-aggregated data just sit here, right? Um, uh, but I also don't necessarily want to refresh all the data in this pre-aggregation all the time, right? Some of this data, like from 2018, I would probably consider that historical data. I don't need to touch these records in, in the table. Um, it's only for data in maybe up to three days ago that I might need to adjust things. And then I'd also want to add more data on top of it, right, obviously. Um, and so that's where we introduce the the uh, concept of partitions and refresh policy. So let's go to our schema. Um, and we're going to add partitions to this data. So this is where you all will follow along with uh, basically adding some code here into the, the pre-aggregation definition. So the first property I'm going to define is called partition granularity. Uh, that's partition, P-A-R-T-I-T-I-O-N-G-R-A-N-U-L-A-R-I-T-I, -I -I -I. uh, Y, sorry, I know, spelling is hard. Um, and uh, for this, I'm going to set a month. So what I'm essentially saying here is let's, so a partition, you, a partition you can think of as an increment or a shard of the data. Um, and the partitions are essentially sharding your pre-aggregation into multiple tables um, based on some attribute, which in our case is the time dimension, the creation time. Um, and each table will represent a month's worth of data. Okay, we're also going to add a refresh key And uh, for that, I'm going to say, let's do it every one minute, which is very frequent. But for the purposes of this demo, uh, we we want to we want to see this in action, right? So by default, this would just be an hour uh, if I did if I left this blank, and that's like around the time that we would expect um, most use cases to need. Uh, I'm also going to set this to incremental true, and I'll explain what that is in just a sec. And I will also set an update window <clears throat> of three days. Now, so it, the incremental true property essentially is saying, uh, de by default, refresh the, la the most recent partition. Um, the update window property is saying that uh, go back it, for whatever amount of time falls within the, or go back three days <laughs> and whatever time that span that is, if that falls within any of the partitions time spans, also refresh those partitions. So I set three days because that's, that's, Again, I'm an e-commerce business, and I really only expect 
uh, orders to be, say, updated within the last three days every now and then. Um, so that would mean effectively here that I've partitioned again my data by month. So only the last month, only one partition, the late, the most recent partition um, should be updated. And actually this data set, uh, it's, it's fabricated data, of course, but uh, we, we also have some future data in it, some made up data for that represents orders in the future. So for the, I want to only have the pre-aggregation uh, cover the data up into the present. So for that, I'm going to add another property, build range end. There's also a build range start, but uh, for this, I'm going to define with SQL, and I'm going to use a SQL statement for that. I'm just going to say up until now. Okay. Um, I'll just stay on this screen for a little bit. So those of you who, who are following along can make sure you, you have these as well. Uh, so what I did, what I did there essentially is, uh, set a end date for my pre aggregation in terms of how much of it will be built, which is today or right now, um, by default, if you don't set the build range end or build range start properties, those will just take the min and max values um, of the time dimension. So uh, essentially your entire data set will be covered. Um, but uh, like I said earlier, I want to make sure that I'm only building this pre-aggregation up to uh, the current time. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And then uh, you'll see, okay, the the API is restarting. So that's, uh, but that's again in development mode. So if I go back to my pre aggregations, should see this start to refresh, which it is. And the partitions should now reflect a much bigger number than one. Looks like it's 44. Uh, partition. So that means that there's 44 months, roughly, worth of data here. And if I click into it, okay, so now we see all these partitions per month. Um, and uh, we also, so we don't have the refresh policy, uh, we don't have the refresh policy in effect, because we are in still in development mode. And so we'll cover that in a bit. I want to show first uh, several ways that you can build these partitions. Okay, um, so let's take two months at random. Let's say April and March. Um, and those of you following along can also do the same. Please don't build all of the partitions uh, all at once. We, we um, while we should be able to handle that, I uh, if everyone did it at once, we may be uh, testing our luck with the database gods. So let's all just pick one or two and we'll build those. Uh, and this should take less time than the 30, was it 35 or 30 seconds uh, that it took to build the pre-aggregation in its entirety. Oh, it looks like April's already done. Um, oh, maybe not. Uh, so April took 11 and a half seconds. I think March is going to follow soon after. Um, so now, uh, effectively, we've, we've, we now have pre-aggregated data for April 2021 and March 2021. And if I go back to Playground, uh, I can see that this is true by uh, now performing that same query. But we're going to use a custom time range now. So let's use, let's do the query on April. I'm just going to do these weeks. Yeah. Run that. OK, yeah, the query was accelerated pre aggregation And you could see that, that that was very quick, right? Now, if I pick, uh, if I pick a different uh, month, so let's say May, and I didn't build May yet. Um, it'll still say that the data is pre-aggregated, 
in in the status but it's gonna this will also trigger the build of the pre-aggregation or the partition that pre-aggregation so you can see okay the query is taking a little bit longer but uh it's what what's happening here is that we're building that partition for the month of May. And yeah, so that probably took about what 11, it was 11 or 12 seconds. Um, so it still says it was accelerated the pre-aggregation, but it obviously <laughs> didn't seem that accelerated. But the next time I run that same query, it'll have you know the the very uh, fast re uh, return time that we were seeing earlier. Um, I realized I didn't uh, dig into the SQL a bit yet here, but you can see if you select the SQL button here on the right, uh, that we are now so, uh, pulling in data from these uh, pre-aggregation tables. Um, so this is, this, is, this is useful to know if you'd like to kind of go in, dive in with SQL and start to inspect what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's essentially partitioning. Now let's talk a little bit more about the refresh policy. And for this, uh, now we can go back to our schema tab, um, and let's commit and push this. And you can so this is the button on the upper right, and you can add whatever message you want. Uh, let's say. Yes. And then I'm going to commit and push. So the reason I'm doing this is because I want to leave development mode and get back to production mode so that we enable the refresh, uh, the automatic refresh to happen. So if you go back to pre-aggregations right now, it'll show no pre-aggregations. Don't worry. That's because we still have to uh, see that, see this schema kind of deployed uh, for our production environment. So if you go back to, I guess we haven't gone to this screen yet, but the overview screen, this will show me the status of my KubeJS uh, builds. So we're deploying the build now. I'm just gonna give that a second to finish. Or I might be able to see the pre aggregations already. Yeah, okay. So it's still deploying. Uh, but if I go and look at this pre-aggregation now and see the partition view again, um, we should see within about a minute <laughs> this partition for August 2021, which again, we set a refresh policy, which would essentially mean, oh, there it goes. So it's automatically refreshing now for the month of August. And I expect this will take about, well, I guess May took about, 17 and a half seconds, but somewhere around 12 to 20 seconds, maybe. Um, and this will be going on every minute now uh, in the production environment. So that's essentially the, the refresh policy. Um, so uh, some things to know about what we just talked about. Uh, Cube generally limits the build of partitions to only two concurrent partitions uh, for Postgres. Uh, it depends on your database type. Um, something to know about building partitions, building pre-aggregations, is that this does depend on um, how, how you set your policy, how often you want to refresh and build. Um, will depend on the concurrency limitations of your database. Um, now, uh, so for Postgres, we generally only set two partitions at a time. But uh, in general, um, you, you can increase that. Uh, there are ways to customize that. So that's something to know. Now, uh, so that we covered uh, partitions and refreshes. I want to, oh, I guess some other things that are useful to see here. Uh, so we talked about the definition of the pre aggregation there's also ways to preview the data and you, you can also in here select the partitions that you want to look at. Um, and also take a look at which uh, queries uh, were using these this particular pre aggregation and kind of see the times that those took. We're not going to cover indexes, but this is also a way to kind of increase the performance 
um, for things in particular, like where you have um, uh, high cardinality data. Uh, we, we're not going to cover that in this workshop. We might cover it in the QA. Um, so yeah, this is, these are some neat features of um, the pre-aggregation view in cloud. Uh, also go back to the queries page and I can explain some of the features here as well. Um, I can filter here by, you know, queries that, uh, let me increase the time range. I can filter by, you know, queries that did use pre aggregations or did not. Um, I can also check out the queries happening on the database, uh, the, basically the, the, the SQL statements. Um, and you can see here, uh, you know, we're creating uh, these tables in the pre-aggregation. Um, we're also running the select statement every once in a while. That's or the select now statement, because as if you recall, that was how we were determining the build range end uh, time is by using that SQL statement. Okay. So jumping uh, to a slightly different topic, uh, and this is pretty, this is where uh, y'all will don't have to follow along anymore in terms of coding. Um, this, this is a different environment that we've set up uh, to show you how roll-up joins work. So uh, roll-up joins essentially is for when you want to create a, sort of like a pseudo pre um that joins data across multiple databases, for example. Um, so in this example, I have uh, two rollups, one for uh, companies with the dimensions of company name and size, uh, and then another for users. Um, yeah, users uh, with the measure of count and uh, dimension of the company that the user is at. Um, and then I've defined a, a, join, a roll up join here, um, which I have to specify as type roll up join because that's different than just a normal, uh, the default type of pre aggregation, which is roll up. Uh, and then the measures and dimensions uh, using user count, company name, company size, uh, and then uh, also uh, defining uh, the roll ups that this is joining. So with that, I can go and see, okay, this is, this is a query that I'm running for user count on user company. And actually not sure why my, oh, there we go. Uh, so this, this is running the query with the, uh, just a single pre aggregation And you can see in the SQL statement, yeah, we're just taking data from one of those pre-aggregations. Now, if I use, uh, let's say company size, the query is gonna change, right? So now we have an actual join between these two uh, rollups uh, and I should be able to run that as well and also see it was accelerated. So yeah, so now I can see, okay, uh, here's my user accounts uh, for large company sizes, small and medium. So that's, that's the concept behind the roll-up join. I should note that um, as of now, uh, across, across database joins, uh, we only support uh, right now using the same database type. So it has to all be within Postgres, for example. We can't join uh, Postgres with, with Mongo, for example, yet. But that's something that we're looking into and we'll hopefully have as a feature as well soon that's supported. Okay, so that was pretty much uh, the workshop part portion of it. Um, I hope that was interesting for all of you. Um, next, I wanna cover a few tips and tricks of the trade. Um, uh, and, yeah. hey, Brian, so well, yeah. we got a lot of questions. So oh. I think we might yes. wanna address a few of those. And I mean, yeah, I, sorry. I mean thanks, for, thanks for doing yeah. this. We wanna give you a chance to get a drink of water is something you've been talking for at least 30 sure. minutes. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully people were able to also follow along. Um, and I mean, if you had any like 
saw issues or glitches, I mean, let us know either chat or even after the session as well. Hopefully things went smoothly. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Ryan, for, for doing this. And we'll, we got a few questions uh, that we'll address and then, and then we'll jump into tips and tricks. Actually, somebody asked a question that was going to be covered in one of your following slides, which I made a note of, uh, but uh, I think Pavel, a uh, couple of questions that came up regarding like multi-tenancy. Um, and uh, so if you wanna, maybe we can start addressing that first and and, uh, and maybe address a couple of others and then we'll go back to Ryan, but. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I see a lot of questions around uh, multi-tenancy, role level security and um, all, all of re related questions regarding pre-agations. So yeah. Um, so the sh short answer uh, pre-agations are compatible with multi-tenancy. And there are several ways um, uh, you, you can approach this. Uh, first of all, um, if you want to uh, reuse uh, pre-agations um, like uh, among different tenants, so you probably want to use uh, so-called query write. There, there is a function. I'm not sure if 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 I post this link to docs uh, in the chat. Uh, if you can see those or not, yeah. Let me let me Google this one. So the the query write allows you to basically. Um, add some filtering uh, during query processing just before it was being executed in, in, in the database. And if you're using this one, you'll be able to add filters based on your security context, based your application context. And this way you can achieve role level security and still reuse uh, pre-agations. Uh, this means you'll have tables of pre-agations which will um, store data for all the tenants. Uh, this one is most uh, cost efficient. However, not all security um, compliances are allowed to do that. Uh, and um, like as an alternative, what you can use, you, you can uh, actually introduce uh, multi-tenant environments using uh, KubeJS multi-tenancy. And then, uh, in this case, you'll be creating uh, pre-gated tables per each tenant, and those will be stored separately, uh, like physically separated. Um, and you also can use uh, like blended approaches, which we see most of, uh, of our users do, is when you are, uh, have shared environments for like uh, probably smaller accounts or uh, where you don't, need to like strict security compliances. And when, where we see also uh, another way we see dedicated accounts where, where you have, for example, a uh, single tenant and uh, a pair pre aggregation table. So you can mix those in general. Um, yeah. So uh, I hope that answers the questions. Um, I saw a lot of uh, like smaller questions. Let me uh, let me address those. Um, uh, is is pregation possible for rolling window? So uh, short answer: Yes, we are working on it. So right now you can uh, uh, even build a rolling window roll up. It's not yet in docs, uh, but uh, we will be updating those. Uh, the only thing which is not supported is a combination of uh, regular measures and um, uh, rolling window measures. And uh, I hope you'll ship it soon within several weeks. Um, uh, yeah, there is also a question regarding if, you're, um, if we support um, Pregations for joint cubes and Ryan just went through it. So we do support, however, it's supported only for same uh, type of database. Uh, okay, let's see what else. Yeah. 
I think there were yeah. a couple of questions on using SQL plus every together. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you want to address those now, but which one is that? Uh, using SQL plus every together. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the the this is um that's a great question. So yeah, uh, there is an issue on GitHub, uh, and uh, um. So yeah, we plan to add support of SQL and every together. And uh, I hope we uh, will be able to sh ship it soon. Um, at least I think uh, like uh, probably this, this quarter, yeah. Um, For those of you who are wondering, this, that's referring to the refresh key that we were just talking about yeah, and that's adding better. this a SQL statement instead of just a plain every property to your refresh key so that you can actually use SQL to determine when the refresh policy is set. Yeah, correct. The way it uh, would work, so it will check SQL statement every, uh, uh, like, uh, like a parent will defined in every statement here. Um, yeah, there are also, there were questions, um, mm, yeah, it's um, regarding if, uh, th this is really, really great and really deep question. Uh, can you uh, go over how to create preagations which will also speed up queries which may have multiple filters applied to them? And we probably covered it uh, later today in a section with tipping tricks, but, uh, short answer you can uh like optimize this stuff a lot using indexes and if you if you'll have some time we'll cover indexes uh, of variations on a cube start or on the cube store side a little bit um okay what else yeah Yeah, I think there was another question that I think Ryan's going to cover. So maybe we'll go through the tips and tricks section and hopefully that will address yeah. several of these questions and then we can take another pause in, in, in yeah. about 10 minutes or so. so yeah. Ryan, if you're okay with that. So. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the slides. Um, just going to go over a few FAQ uh, questions first. When does it make most sense to use a pre-aggregation? So that's a great question. Um, wh well, uh, some different types of members or of measures uh, are definitely m easier to work with, I would say, with pre-aggregation. And those include count sum, max min, um, count distinct, uh, which, which we uh, use count distinct approximate for, which I'll explain in a bit. But these are essentially measures that uh, these are additive measures is the term, which means that they can be added together. Um, so a counterexample may be a good way to explain this. Uh, if you take average, which is actually a more complicated or a more calculated measure, um, that's doable, but, also, but still a little more complicated to set up with a pre-aggregation. Um, count distinct. So that's also you know, something we often need in our queries. Um, what QGIS does is we use uh, special SQL backend dependent functions to basically estimate these distinct counts. And we typically use uh, some algorithm like uh, what's called hyperlog log. Um, so wherever possible, QGIS will use that uh, to, to really improve the calculation time uh, of these distinct counts. And it, it, these, these count distincts end up being estimates, but should be very close estimates. Um, so uh, in general, it's, it's trickier when um, dealing with these calculated measures or also with, um, uh, for example, cubes, uh, cubes measures and dimensions that have one to many relationships with other measures and dimensions. Um, and we'll, we can go over some of those 
distinct or unique use cases, I guess, in a future workshop as well. Um, or if we have time, uh, we can talk about those in, in depth here. Um, and then how do I increase the chances of my queries actually hitting a pre-aggregation? So instead of going to the source database and performing queries on raw data, I want to increase the chances that my queries will actually return results from my pre-aggregated data. Well, the very, very high level rule of thumb here is, well, the more dimensions and the more measures you define in your pre-aggregation, right? So this was a pretty simple data set. We didn't have that many uh, dimensions uh, and measures, but um, the more I add here, uh, you know, the more that that pre-aggregation will cover. Um, that does, of course, mean a larger pre-aggregation data set. And so there's that trade-off, right, of making this a larger pre-aggregation to cover more queries, right? But if you have a use case where your users are going to be performing a lot of ad hoc queries, it's really going to be hard to predict like what they'll be searching by, for example, uh, or querying by, um, then it may, be, it may be best to do that. Um, there, you can also add more pre-aggregations. You don't have to have everything all in, um, everything aggregated in a single one. Um, some other things to know is that the time dimension and the granularity of the query have to match the pre-aggregation itself. Um, so let me make sure I didn't save. Uh, I didn't save that. So, okay. Um, but so, uh, oh, so recall that I, uh, when we built this pre-aggregation, it used a granularity of day, um, not week, even though I was running the query by week. And uh, the reason for that is because the start and end times of <laughs> each unit of your time dimension will need to match the queries start and end times, right? So weeks are the one uh, granularity type which are trickier to work with because not all. Um, so oh, let me let me give the the general use case uh, as an example. So we created this pre-aggregation based on days, right? So that means if I were to query uh, by hour. Right, I'm not going to get. I should see we couldn't use that pre-aggregation, right? And that's that's true, right? Because the day is not granular enough to cover that case. But if I cover, uh, let's say I do, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember where, which which partitions we built. Oh, it looks like we built a lot of them. So I can uh, query by, let's say, from May to July, and I query by month, that will be accelerated because days are a unit of granularity that fall within a month. The reason why we didn't use weeks is because weeks don't always start and end on the start and end dates of months or years, right? Which are the larger uh, granularities of um, time. And so weeks are always trickier to deal with. It, it also you know, it, it can be confusing of whether a week starts on a Sunday or a Monday, depending on what, uh, what uh, calendar type you use. So we generally avoid weeks for granularity. But as you can see from this example, uh, any time granularity that is basically a larger unit of measure um, can cover, uh, that the pre aggregation will have that query covered, OK? Um, also, the order in which your uh, pre-aggregations are defined uh, matters in, in the schema. So uh, if I were to start adding my second uh, pre-aggregation here, right, my any incoming queries would first be checked against my first pre-aggregation. Um, Bef and seeing if that's a match. And then if that doesn't match, we would go, it, cube would check the second pre-aggregation is defined. So 
just something to know about the order of pre-aggregations in your schema as well. Um, hopefully that, that tells you a bit about how you can kind of increase the chance, how you can optimize your pre-aggregations, uh, how they're defined such that you maximize the chances of those queries actually hitting them. <clears throat> I also want to cover some of the things that you should probably have on your checklist when running in production. So most of, these thing, most of these things you don't have to worry about if you're running on Cube Cloud because <laughs> obviously we do this for you. Uh, but uh, as Pavel mentioned, uh, Cube Store is really, was really built um, for an, and optimized for this use case. Um, so that helps get around some of the latency and concurrency issues that you may see with various database types that would make them ill can bad candidates for um, uh, storing pre-aggregated data. Also cost concerns, right? Like if you're running on, if you're processing this data uh, every time you're running a query on um, one of those database types that charges you by the process, uh, processed amount of data, uh, that can be quite costly. Um, some other things to have, so dedicated refresh worker, a dedicated Redis instance, these are all to help with uh, scalability, right? We don't want to have to um, run everything on, um, on the cube ser one cube server instance. And uh, actually in cloud, um, you'll see that uh, you can, oh, uh, here. Uh, you can set single instance or cluster mode for the deployment type. Um, so all of, most of you, I assume, will be in the single instance mode. Um, but uh, if you were to run in cluster mode, this would create uh, uh, instances of uh, cube of uh, the refresh worker and the Redis uh, cache, which would be dedicated instances. And then uh, batching and exporting data. So Batching is something that, uh, it's one of these tabs, yeah. Batching is, um, is on by default. There's no configuration required for this. And this is, uh, this is um, enabled for Postgres. It depends on the, on the database type, but Postgres uh, should, should have this. Um, so to illustrate what happens without batching or export, right, all this data that's being uh, consumed to build pre would essentially be um, writ, uh, loaded into memory on cube before being written to, um, to cube store. And if that's a large data set and it's like around 100K rows is where we start to see problems, then that's where cube, uh, the node runtime on cube will start to run out of memory. So that's why we have batching as a means of kind of freeing up um, the memory available on the KubeJS instance. And that's essentially just sending compressed CSVs to KubeStore. Um, export is another thing that has to be configured. And it's uh, for certain database types like BigQuery and Snowflake, a few others. Um, so this is essentially setting up external cloud storage where you will be materializing that data um, in, instead of run it, uh, loading it onto uh, QGS directly. And that also uh, is another way of kind of preventing uh, memory overload on, on cube. Um, and so that's batching and exporting. Then uh, as we just t discussed in length, like tuning your pre-aggregation build and refresh times, um, that's always something that you may not get perfect on the first try, but uh, you'll see, you know, and in Cube Cloud, we have a lot of tools available at your disposal to kind of inspect, you know, what queries are going on, um, what's happening on the database side, so that you can see if your pre aggregations partitions are not being built at their expected times. Um, uh, and, and so you can start to tune your refresh policy and the size of your partitions, for example, or or anything like that, that would help with making sure that 
you're continuing to serve non-stale data to users at optimal query speed times. Um, so yeah, those are some tips and tricks that I hope were helpful. Um, and uh, we can start to cover any other topics, I think, that we didn't cover yet. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ryan. And uh, yeah, I've been monitoring some of the questions. And yes, apologies if I, if I inadvertently, quote unquote, dismissed your question. I've been to, I've meant to mark them as done. So please don't take it personally if I made a mistake. So I think a lot of the questions were answered by Pavel a few minutes ago. Uh, I think there were a couple more questions that um, Pavel, I, I think one of them was regarding. Uh, let me see. Give me a second. Uh, the time zone difference and pre-aggregations. Not sure if that was um, that was addressed. If you want to quickly talk about that, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, huh. Yeah. There was a question: How does pre-aggregation handle time zone difference? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, uh, really great question. So uh, right now, uh, like short answer. Each time zone we would have each own variation table. Uh, and the reason for it, uh, especially for daily or weekly variations, uh, uh, there is no way to uh, derive, uh, for example, uh, uh, daily variation data in one time zone from daily variation data in another time zone. Uh, I guess in future we are going to suffer deriving those from hourly data. However, there, there, there are also half our time zones, like um, uh, in the world, there are several of them, which um, basically uh, doesn't fit this pattern well. Uh, but, but yeah, in general, we are going to support our hourly deriving for those. Cool. Thanks. And the next question I'm looking at here in either you, Pavel or Ryan, I think either you could like answer this. Are there any limits on the number of tables in pre-aggregations, uh, tables created for pre-aggregations? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great, great question. So um, there are a couple of um, uh, limitating factors here. And uh, 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 one factor is uh, the size uh, of uh, like uh, amount, like count of tables in source database. Uh, and right now, and it's related to another question, uh, like uh, how uh, like KubeJS stores uh, variegated tab tables and why do I see those in my source database? Um, like originally by default, uh, KubeJS uh, was using uh, the source databases prior to download those to Cube Store. Uh, going forward, we are going to switch um, most of our data sources to read-only mode, so you don't uh, need to give write access to KubeJS in order to use variations. So those will be downloaded um, like uh, using uh, in in memory approach and. Uh, yeah, for some of those which are like bigger data backends, uh, we will be supporting uh, will be uh, supporting unload stuff, as Ryan mentioned. And for those, you will need to give write access because, for example, BigQuery doesn't allow you to unload tables unless you create those, like materialize those in in BigQuery itself. So, um, but overall, uh, right now uh, there is. A limiting factor of how many like tables source database can handle, and it depends a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot on on database itself. And the second second is um, how many tables can be handled by Cube Store itself. And what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to decouple uh, like uh, ta table count from like performance of Cube Store. And uh, so right now it's being tested on uh, dozens of thousands of tables. Uh, and we are going to uh, like accelerate this like uh, even, even further. So, so it should be uh, like virtually uh, unlimited, but uh, I guess uh, in, uh, in a couple of months, given 
all the performance optimizations we are doing right now it should be like uh, hundreds of thousand tables that can be handled. Um, cool. Yeah, and I'm not sure if Ryan, you covered this. There's a question I'm, I'm scrolling back. Is, is there a way to know whether it's, this query is picked up from pre-aggregations or it was queried directly from the database? Yeah. Um, so in Kube Cloud, this is, this is quite observable. Uh, so back on the queries tab, um, there's this filter where you can see whether, you know, I can filter by whether it was using a pre-aggregation or it wasn't. Um, this is a good way to see uh, when those queries happened, what, what those queries were uh, as well. So I can click into them and uh, see uh, what the query was in SQL, for instance, as well. And uh, uh, um, also then take a look at, well, what's the pre-aggregation that I could potentially use uh, to uh, uh, basically serve data from that query should it happen again in the future. Cool. Okay. I think uh, this one from a few minutes ago, is there a way to use context variables in pre-aggregation refresh keys? Yeah, great question. And uh, that's actually related to um, multi-tenancy. Um, so uh, short answer, you can and should use those variables if, you're, uh, if you want to split um, pre-aggregation tables and don't reuse across multiple tenants. And if you, if you want uh, to reuse some pre-aggregation tables across multiple tenants, so you should just uh, uh, avoid using like context variables or compile context in these places, just to uh, make sure um, so uh, you uh, like not basically filtering out uh, like like uh, one tenant uh, if you are using data from another one. Cool. Uh, another question, uh, where are the tables for uh, pre-aggregated data created? Can I manage their names of, of the tables, I assume? But... Yeah, uh, great question. As I, as I just uh, described it, so um, uh, there, like tables created in a source database right now uh, for uh, most of data sources, but we are moving towards uh, not creating those by default. And uh, uh, those will be created also in Cube Store. And yes, you can manage uh, pre-aggregation table names. Uh, there is a SQL alias uh, pre-aggregation option that you can use to basically control it. Cool. All right, and then uh, this is a pretty broad question. What's the underlying technology for KubeStore? Yeah, huh. really great questions, yeah. So um, under the hood of KubeStore, we use uh, Apache Arrow and Data Fusion. Um, this one is written in Rust, uh, like technology is relatively new. Um, so multiple companies are working on it, uh, in, including um, InfluxDB, guys, Influx Data guys. And uh, uh, under the hood, we use Parquet as a storage layer, we, which is backed up uh, by um, um, basically distributed file system. And we, we support currently uh, S3 and uh, uh, basically uh, um, um, Google Cloud Storage. Uh, only two of them, but going forward, we are going to support more. Uh, but yeah, uh, overall, it's Data Fusion, Apache Arrow, and Parquet as a storage layer. Cool. I think we'll do one more from the Q&A. And then we also had questions. I'm, I'm, make, I'm trying to make sure I don't forget this. There are people submitted like a questions when they register, so we'll go over those as well. Um, so one more from the Q&A. Uh, can pre-aggregated data be joined with non-pre-aggregated fly dimensions? Yeah, um, this is uh, 
a question we we've been frequently asked and uh, like short answer currently is no uh we do not suffer joining appreciated or or merging it in any way with like pregated and non pregated data uh so it's still on our plate and we are thinking about how to address this and uh yeah uh, like we are welcome anyone with these use cases to post it in on github and uh like uh involve be involved in the discussions there so uh we we can see all the use cases which are uh which require this approach yeah. cool yeah so i think there were broadly like a three um questions or you know, like uh, three topics they asked us to cover when people register i think one of them was high cardinality dimensions and time dimensions uh, see if you want to like a uh, quickly address those, um, that would be great. Yeah, so um, this is a um, uh, really category of questions, uh, which is uh, which uh, was also addressed by a uh, question about filtering. So how do we pregate really high cardinality roll up tables? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, using indexes. So in order to approach this uh, in Cube Store, we introduced uh, indexes and uh, basically those working uh, a little bit different than uh, indexes in, uh, like in relational databases. So indexes in Cube Store are uh, copies of your data. So you're paying uh, uh basically twice while you're ingesting data in terms of uh like processing cost or like computing cost however in terms of querying time uh you're basically getting uh, the most uh, uh uh like the the, per the performance which can be unmatched without uh like using uh copies of data here so and if you're using indexes you can basically uh uh, so indexes essentially is a different sorting order for columnar data, if you are familiar with this concept. But uh, the approach, like simple approach you can use is basically to <clears throat> uh, put all filtering uh, columns, which you are using on pregation filtering queries in, in index. And you'll see uh, like um, significant performance improvement in terms of uh, like certain pregations, like hard cardinality pregations, uh, queries where you use filters. So this is a uh, like simple approach and uh, it allows you to serve really, really like hard cardinality um, uh, tables. Uh, so uh, up to a billion of rows in it. <coughs> cool. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and I think this was asked, I mean, uh, in the Q&A as well, or maybe it was in chat, like uh, in general, how pre-aggregation pre queues work. Uh. Yeah, so um, uh, as uh, as Ryan already showed you in, uh, in basically in, uh, in KubeCloud, you can see uh, those queries on and a query tab and a, and a database tab. So this is a uh, uh, database execution queue. So um, originally KubeJS has multiple queues and those work pretty similar. Uh, it has a uh, uh, query queue for querying actual data and the same query queue implementation is used to build pre aggregations. And uh, however, uh, as we going forward and uh, we have all of those cube store optimizations, for example, one of which uh, like cube store doesn't use Redis queue to uh, basically fulfill queries. Uh, it's something I talked in the beginning. Um, it allows you to achieve uh, like a much performance uh, because all your API instances not interconnected. So there is no latency and fulfilling uh, for fulfilling all the coordination between API instances. But um, like pre queue 
still using uh, like this query queue implementation. And the simple idea is uh, you have dedicated refresh worker which schedules uh, all workload on this queue. And uh, main, uh, uh, basically, uh, main goal of this queue is to limit uh, throughput to your database so it, no, it doesn't get swamped. And by default, uh, as Ryan mentioned, uh, so there is very low, uh, basically, a threshold, uh, like throughput threshold for, for databases, uh, which can be uh, um, uh, basically changed uh, in options. But, but yeah, it's it just a, a very, uh, uh, very simple queue that uh, allows to limit the throughput uh, of building predictions. Uh, if you if you want to really understand what happens under the hood, you just probably want to see it in how it works in Cube Cloud because all those controls is is very uh, like uh, all the visualizations uh, feel very natural once you see those. Yeah. Cool. And I think the other the last one was about like reducing cost. And I mean, for example, by you know, using KubeStore plus like refresh node, but um, yeah, anything you want to add there, Pavel? Yeah, uh, in terms of reducing cost, uh, so the very simple approach to reduce cost using uh, variations is uh, usually uh, uh, as a rule of thumb, you should see all the queries um, uh, like more, what are the most of the queries hitting your raw data? And it's usually 90% of them. 90% uh, uh, of them would can be fulfilled by single rollout table. It's what we see on most of our deployments. And once you build this rollout table, partition it, and uh, configure um, correct update strategy, what you'll see that if you cut all this like 90% of your queries to raw data and just uh, like pre pregation would be fulfilling those, you won't be hitting raw data anymore. And uh, basically cost of pregation refresh is much lower for most of uh, big data backends. And uh, in terms of latency, it can be even like, you can refresh it even like one once five minutes. But the thing is, uh, when you're uh, like along your users to access raw data, you're paying for each request the same price because it's, uh, data access not based on a time consumed usually, usually, but it's uh, based on access itself, the fact of access. And uh, pregations allow you to basically cut all of this uh, raw data access queries and uh, convert those to single refresh queries, which can be not as frequent as your user access. Cool, thank you, Pavel. Uh, yeah, so I think like, um, uh, Ryan, just a question for you. I think you may have covered this in terms of uh, like, like specifying or scheduling when pre-aggregation is refreshed. Uh, I just saw that question come up. Um, and then, yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to share an example of like a count this thing, but I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Oh, uh, me, yeah. yes. Uh, and we're just, <laughs> we were cooking this up quickly in the back end. Yeah. Uh, uh, give us one sec. If yeah. anyone else wants to answer a question. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I guess what? while we're doing that, Pavel, like, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if this was covered. Like, can you specify when pre-aggregation is refreshed at like a 6 a.m. each morning or, you know, 15 minutes after the hour, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah. So short answer, we have a cron syntax for that. So uh, and you can go to, to the docs, uh, it's called refresh key and you, you can find cron section there. Yeah, okay. so we separated. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was one of the things that 
uh, Ryan went over and that. Uh, it's always more interesting questions. But uh, uh, Ryan, if you're not ready, I can just quickly uh, cover the resources slide because uh, I know we're, we're trying to come up with, with, with stuff real time. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah, I'm on, take, I so. yeah take, I can, I'm okay. oh, sorry. Like I'll, I'll give you back control, sorry. But uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, in case you haven't, uh, are not familiar with these resources, I just want to mention this and I'll, we'll go back to, to Ryan. Uh, obviously, I mean, documentation, we're, um, uh, you know, we're making improvements uh, on a daily basis, but just basically go to the caching section and that you'll see a lot of the topics that, um, that both Pavel and Ryan reference uh, already in documentation. If something's missing, I mean, open an issue or PR and let us know. And there's a, a blog post uh, that was originally written a while ago, and we'll probably make uh, updates with, with our latest features, but there's our, our original blog post on free aggregations that gives you a, a good overview. And in general, I mean, uh, many of you have been uh, uh, very comfortable with, with Slack and, and posting things on Discord. So if, if there are other questions as you're getting started or using pre-aggregations, uh, feel free to post questions. And uh, I've noticed that a lot of the questions are being answered uh, not only by our KubeDAO team members, but community members as well. So it's great to see uh, experiences that, that, have been, uh, that are being shared by community members. And one final resource, uh, as a lot of these questions came up, I, I think some of you may have uh, met or heard from Jordan uh, during monthly calls. He's a head of uh, uh, our, uh, our GM of KubeCloud, and there are a lot of questions about uh, KubeCloud in general. So, I mean, Jordan, I'll, I'll let you answer that question and how people can get a hold of you if they have any follow-up questions on KubeCloud. But... Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to confirm, you can hear me right now, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I saw a couple questions about how does the pricing structure work with Cube Cloud? Um, what does support look like? What are the differences? And I will make sure that Ray actually links me directly in a follow up to the open source channel. And so you can contact me via Slack for more specific information. Um, it, it really, the, the quick answer between what are the differences is that. Um, Cube Cloud is a managed version of the open source. So it's basically infrastructure plus some additional tooling equals Cube Cloud is what it is. And as you could see when, when Ryan was going through things, uh, the Cube Cloud actually has a, a specific dropdown or a page dedicated to pre aggregations. You can do pre aggregations with open source, uh, but there's a specific area dedicated to pre aggregations in the cloud. And that's Again, kind of the, the goal is to ha add a little bit of uh, advanced tooling to what is already existing in the open source. That's just one of the many things that we're adding. So um, I probably should have started by saying that I'm um, the general manager of the Cube Cloud and I'm in, in charge of the planning and execution of bringing the cloud to, uh, to availability for you and, and all those who are able to test it out today. So um, questions around pricing and support are, are all specific to everyone's use case and how they actually want to use the product. But I can tell you that there will be multiple levels in which you can engage with us from, um, you know, basically like workday hours, uh, nine to five support all the way to 24 seven, one hour SLA support and those pricing models adjust accordingly. And it's the same thing with uh, our cloud uh, offering. You will have an offering for those like a freemium version, people who want to just use the product for, free up to a, a, you know, almost like a test or a pilot for you and your team. Then there's also shared or dedicated VPCs depending on your data needs. Um, so there's, a, I can go into this forever, but I don't want to bore everybody and um, it'd be great to get everyone out before the two hour mark. So again, um, I will actually uh, send out my email in the chat after this, after we pass this back to Ryan, and then I will have Ray at me in a follow-up message so people can just click and directly Slack me. That's, that's probably the best way to, to get in touch. Cool, thanks. Thanks for thanks for jumping on, Jordan. Yeah, we, I mean, intentionally, we didn't want to make this a, a sales pitch for, for Cube Cloud necessarily. We wanted to use it as a platform for, uh, for the workshop. But uh, yeah, thanks for jumping on, Jordan, to answer uh, questions from the audience. And uh, yeah, Ryan, I'll, let me stop sharing, so I'll turn things back to you. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to show an example of the count distinct, uh, which was asked about. So I have a lot of windows open now. Um, so yeah, here in the schema, we've defined pre-aggregation with the uh, account distinct measure. Um, this measure here. Um, and uh, yeah, just a time dimension of the creation at time. And uh, you can see from Playground, if I run this query, which is using that unique count uh, measure and uh, creation time um, as a dimension, just doing it over the last 30 days. Um, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting accelerated uh, query for that. So again, this, this was the, how it was defined in the schema for those of you who were interested in that. Cool, pretty, thank pretty you. Awesome. Yeah. awesome, like you're able to come up with this real time, which is <laughs> just cool. So yeah, and I also uh, uh, added a note on chat as well. Uh, recently uh, created a pre-aggregations workshop uh, channel on Slack, uh, which uh, people also discovered as well. Uh, so feel free to, uh, if any questions sort of fell through the cracks, I mean, hopefully we answered, uh, you know, vast majority of them. Uh, and uh, if, if there are any follow-up questions on the workshop or, uh, I mean, Jordan's on there too. So if you want to reach out to like Jordan or myself uh, in the Slack channel, I mean, feel, feel free to do that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, that, uh basically covers all the agenda topics that, that we wanted to talk about. I mean, first of all, wanted to, uh, I mean, thank everyone for not only registering, but joining. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's well like past like almost hundred minutes since we started and there are still like 66 people on, 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 on the workshop, which is above and beyond what we anticipated. So, I mean, uh, uh, Appreciate your participating. Uh, hope you found it uh, useful and, and participating with your questions as well. And then, yeah, and feel free to um, reach out to me with questions and encourage once again to fill out the post event survey that will go out shortly. And then hopefully we'll do this again soon. So, and thank you, like uh, Ryan and Pavel, for, for leading, leading our discussions today. So. Yeah, thanks for having us. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.